Discretion is advised. This is the Minute Murder. George Stenney Jr. was born on October 21, 1929. He grew up in Alkaloo, South Carolina. His father, George Stenney Sr., worked at the local lumber yard and sawmill. The sawmill brought a lot of life to the small town, employing many of its residents. The Stenney family even lived in a company-owned house. Their house was small, with a chicken coop in the back, but room enough for George, his parents, and his siblings. When George Stenney was 14... He was still pretty small. He was only 5 foot 1 inch and around 95 pounds. He had a younger sister named Amy that he often referred to as his shadow. She followed him everywhere he went. On March 22, 1944, they were playing outside of the house when two little white girls riding their bikes stopped to talk to them. This was extremely unusual. At the time, the town was still extremely segregated. The white and black families attended different churches, the children went to separate schools, and the railroad tracks divided their housing. The girls were looking for Maypops. It's a name they used in that area for passion flowers, and Stinney told them he didn't know where to look for the Maypops, so the girls continued on their way. The next day, while his parents were away at work, two black cars rolled down the dusty driveway. Amy was scared, and she hid in the chicken coop. George and his brother John were taken into custody and questioned for murder. Betty June Binnaker, age 11, and Mary Emma Thames, age 7, never made it home from their bike ride. Their bodies had been found on the black side of the train tracks, their heads beaten with a blunt object strong enough to crush their skulls, and the oldest had physical signs that she may have been raped. John was released but George Stinney was charged with the crimes. One of the arresting officers claimed that Stinney gave a full confession and even told them where to look for the murder weapon. After a search of the area, they found a railroad spike. In just 81 days, Stinney was dead too. The trial started and ended on April 24th. Stinney's defense was made up of one court-appointed counsel, Charles Plowden, a tax commissioner that was running for a local office. The prosecution called on three of the arresting officers, the reverend that discovered the girls' bodies and the two doctors that performed the post-mortem exams. Plowden didn't even cross-examine the prosecution's witnesses, called in none of his own, did not challenge the prosecutor's recollection of events, even though he told two different versions, and did not question why there was no record, written or confirmed, of the confession. He did nothing to defend George Stinney Jr. The entire proceeding lasted only two and a half hours. In less than ten minutes, the jury, which consisted of twelve white men, returned from deliberation with a verdict of guilty for the 14-year-old boy. Judge Philip Stoll sentenced Stinney to death by electrocution. The crowd, both in and around the courthouse, seemed pretty pleased with the finding. There were over 1,000 white men and women that showed up for the trial. Even though the defendant was black, they did not allow black men or women in the courthouse. From the time Stenny was arrested, his parents were not allowed to see him until after the trial. He sat in the interrogation rooms alone, no parents and no counsel. He sat in jail awaiting the trial, alone. His parents had not been allowed to visit or communicate with him at all. Stenny's father was fired from his job, and since they lived in a company-owned house, they had to immediately move. They relocated closer to grandparents while they figured out what to do. They tried to find someone to help them appeal the ruling. Local churches and the NAACP appealed to Governor Olin Johnson to consider clemency considering the age of the boy. Ironically, most of the letters he received were from white women that didn't want to see someone so young executed. The governor visited Stenny two days before his execution. The governor said that he wanted those begging for clemency to know that Stenny killed the smaller girl 
so that he could rape the bigger one. But then he killed the bigger one before raping her dead body. He even returned later with the intention of raping her again, but found the body was already too cold. He claimed Stenny admitted all of it. Of course, it was reported that all of those were rumors that the governor heard, and that it never came from Stenny directly. Stenny told other inmates that he was coerced and maintained his innocence. On June 16, 1944, at 7.30 a.m., he was prepared for execution. His arms and legs and body were restrained to the chair. He was too short, so they placed a thick Bible under him. When asked if he had any last words, he said, No, sir. Then they placed the leather strap in his mouth, and he burst into tears. They placed a mask that seemed way too large on his head, and his sobs could be heard around the room. With the first flick of electricity, the mask shook off of his head, revealing the tear-stained face of the young boy. It took three flips of the switch before he was pronounced dead. There was a witness from one of the victim's families and said that the event was not nearly so dramatic. He denied that they placed a Bible under him or that the mask fell off as soon as the electricity was turned on. Exact records of the event cannot be found, so we can only go on what is recounted from those that were there. So why, 80 years later, is this case still being debated? In case you haven't been able to tell so far in the story, very little has been actually agreed upon what occurred in 1944. In 2004, George Frierson, a historian that grew up in Alkalu, started researching the case. It wasn't long before several pro bono lawyers got involved, and then they got more people to volunteer. They went through historical documents, found witnesses, and located evidence that they believe could exonerate Stinney. Although there was no transcript of the actual trial, a motion for a new trial was filed in 2013. In 2014, the Civil Rights and Restorative Justice Project at Northeastern University filed an amicus brief with the court, stating that the case was based exclusively on a confession that was not recorded or written and taken without the consent of parents or presence of counsel. Rather than approving a new trial, the judge vacated the conviction. The overturning of the conviction did not mean that Stenny was innocent, but that he did not receive a fair trial and should not have been executed so quickly. The new ruling also caused a flood of responses. The Stenny family was thrilled. They always claimed that Stenny was innocent, that he was with the siblings when the murders occurred, and he could not have done it. The Bickner and Thames families were disappointed. While they understood that he may not have received a fair trial, they felt as though he was being painted as a poor black boy that was unfairly charged with a crime, but in reality was undoubtedly guilty. The different opinions continued to be vocalized. There was an interview from Stinney's seventh grade teacher that was published in 1995 that claimed he had threatened a girl at school the day the crime took place. Amy, Stinney's sister, contacted him and claimed that he told her it was not true, but he was paid to say that. The teacher died shortly after, so neither side of the story could be confirmed. The reverend that found the bodies said that there was very little blood in the ditch. Considering how badly the girls had been beaten if they had been killed there, it seemed as though there would be a lot more blood. If they had been killed somewhere else and then moved there, it didn't seem possible that such a small child could have picked them both up and carried them. There was a theory that the girls may have been killed by George Burke Jr., Stinney's mom worked for their family for a short time. They were a wealthy white family. She was uncomfortable with the advances of the father. When she told her husband about it, he told her not to return to work for that family. Mrs. Burke was angry over the whole event, maybe a little embarrassed, and the theory is that the boys hurt the girls and pinned it on George Stinney Jr. to get even. Added to that, George Burke Sr. owned the property where the girls were found and served as the foreman on the grand jury in Stinney's case. Supposedly, a member of the family made a deathbed confession about the event, but once again, there are no records and no one to confirm it. Now, Alkaloo, South Carolina seems like a forgotten town. With a population of around 400 people, weeds have reclaimed old buildings and vacant stores line the streets. 
Yet, the memory of what happened is far from fading. Three memorial crosses are placed at the ditch where the girls were found. One for each young life lost after a tragic event. Sometimes it's not the truth that decides the outcome of a story. Sometimes the majority can be persuaded by which side is the most convincing. As the old saying goes, believe nothing you hear and half of what you see. That's 10-Minute Murder for today. Brief and bingeable true crime. I'm Joe, I'm the host, and I really appreciate you listening. If you're new to 10-Minute Murder, make sure you hit subscribe right now wherever you like to listen to podcasts. Probably where you're listening right now, going to go out on a limb and and assume that about it, Uh, just hit subscribe, and that will more easily help you catch up on all of the back episodes. Now, that is if you're a brand new listener. Now, if you're an OG listener, Chances are you've already caught up on all the back episodes. And if that's the case, make sure you are following 10-Minute Murder on all places that the podcast has a presence on social media. Links from the show notes of the episode or go to 10minutemurder.com and you'll find the links to all of that stuff. Now, we haven't done this in a while, but uh, a quick listener email. Hi, Joe. It's been ages since you gave a list of pet peeves or things bothering you right now. So so do it, please. I like your podcast. Nancy in North Kakalaki. And by the way, she wrote North Kakalaki. I didn't just try to sound cool and say that. Um, what's bothering me right now? Man, I, I try to stay pretty positive, so it's difficult to come up with this on the spot. However, uh, stop saying that people rock. You rock. Nobody has rocked since like 2004. We can stop saying that. Hit me up. Knock it off. Don't say that anymore. And also, why are we doing shout outs still? Uh, we don't. We, we can mention something, but shout outs. I'd like for shout out the term shout out to just all together go away. I cringe a little bit every time someone says, "Let me give you a shout out." Now it's different in different contexts. In different contexts, which I'm not going to go into. Like it's it's acceptable, but for most contexts, I don't want to be shouted out. I don't want to hear someone be shouted out. I don't. I don't know why that bothers me, and I understand that it's irrational, but. I was asked the question by Nancy in North Kakalaki, so I feel like I'm compelled to answer. All right, that's going to do it. That is the episode for today. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast, and I'll see you in the next one.